We've all been there, in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly, until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration, Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. John, how can you always have the right TV for the right application without carrying hundreds of valves on your truck? You can carry the hundreds of valves on a trailer behind your truck. That's too funny. That would work, but how are you gonna do that? Maybe there's an easier way. You can use Sporland's interchangeable cartridge style Type Q and Type BQ uh, TEVs. Type Q is a conventional design and Type BQ is a balanced for TV. Well, come on, I need easy. How easy is it? Uh, easy is one, two, three. And it serves thousands of unique applications. So what's the process? How do I put this together? First, you select the thermostatic element assembly. Then you select the body that you need. Then you select the right size cartridge for the application to get the proper capacity TEV for your application. And then I guess it should also be said you want to actually assemble those to a single valve. That'd probably be a good idea. Indeed. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you're always carrying the right valve for the right job then. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to sporland.com and find more information on the Type Q and BQ thermostatic expansion valves. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. This is going to be just gold. I know it's going to be gold. I'm going to pour as much gasoline on this conversation as possible. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. And today we actually have a special guest, Mr. James Coleman under the fourth. I mean, James Coleman from CoolSys. How are we doing today, man? Yeah. I actually got out from underneath the 405 freeway today. I shaved up a little bit and just, just for this podcast, I'm, I'm doing really good. How about you guys? We're doing good. Kev, how about your week? I've been interested. I, I haven't talked to you in a minute. I figured you've been really busy this week. What's been going on? Actually, been like pretty chill. Just changing compressors on 30-year-old bracks and slamming the keys on a damn FOSS controller to hope it just doesn't work anymore. So you push them through the screen? Yeah. And then, yeah, other than that, just, just changing compressors and trying to catch up for me. I have a couple of days off last week. So in the utter chaos that was the, the beginning of the week wow so, what, what was what was what was the chaos in the beginning of the week oh like just all the stuff that didn't get done thursday and friday when i was gone and uh, was sitting and emails and planning and we're doing some special project that i'm not allowed to talk about so I mean, we, we talked about this you'd, you'd probably be a little bit better off if you did a little bit more and yeah. and work, work with your buddy to make sure you get get them up to par where you, you need to be really ready. you really want to go down this conversation this this rabbit hole no, nope, no, nope, nope. James, how are you doing today, man? Like, it's, I'm good. I'm, I'm actually, I feel really honored to be here. Oh, that's awesome, man. I, I don't know why, but for anyone that doesn't know, James, why don't, you, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, how you maybe how you got in the industry and 
and uh, what you do on the, on the regular and, and how long it took you to maybe get there. And, you know, so my name's James Coleman. I've been in the industry for a little over 10 years, maybe 11 years. I don't know. I, I'm losing count right now. I, my dad's always been in air conditioning, the industrial side on doing EMS and controls and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, writing programs and, and that sort of thing. I never wanted to get into this industry because I didn't feel like his job excited me. And so I went to school to become a welder. I went to Mount San Antonio College in Southern California. That's a junior college. I did like three, three or four years there. I was taking an AS degree at the same time, which I didn't finish because I couldn't stay awake in the classes. Mm -hmm. uh, you were taking, and, were you taking like women's literature and shit? Oh yeah, absolutely. And so I ended up moving in with a roommate that works for a company in Northern California called RSI. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time he worked for, well, what is now cool sis at the time it was source and he was getting all kinds of raises, doing really good passing. We have a level structure at, at source. He was passing his levels and, and getting good raises. And I was like, man, like I'm working just as hard as you. Like I got to work sometimes nights and days and, and I'm working all kinds of hours. I'm like, I might as well do something that, that gives me a good return on my, on my time invested. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. He ended up, it took me shit, like seven or eight months of basically interviewing multiple times with the service manager. And once they figured out that I was going to be dedicated, they gave me a shot. And it was a gentleman named Sammy Iatt. Shout out to him that gave me my first shot. When I started with a gentleman named Laurel Reyes, and I still talk to him today. He's one of my good buddies. And started bottom of the barrel de-icing cases in the middle of the night and still working during the day, 16, 18, 20 hour days were not uncommon every day of the week. I think like my pivoting point was when we lost a certain customer, a C store customer, and I got forced into supermarkets. And that was like six months into me being in the trade. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we, we lost the C store customer and picked up another supermarket customer and it was all time and material and the stores basically the supermarket customer ended up at that time having their current contractor walk away from them mm. and just left them high and dry That's hard. And, and the, the stores were just an absolute fucking disaster like every store you go to the entire store was off on oil or the condenser was down or what have you so it was like two summers of that and it was just brutal. And so when, and you, you have the availability when you're working that many hours to make a ton of money and I'm, and I'm leveling up at the same time. And it was like every six months I was taking my level tests and, and because you could challenge it. So I would take the test, pass it, move on to the next one. I think like within three years, I was up to level six and that's kind of where I figured out that, okay, training is great. But it can only take you so far. Like you have to push yourself to really advance from there. And yeah. then I left, I left cool sis after about like five and a half years to pursue an opportunity to be a service manager, which I found out was a complete and utter mistake. The service manager portion of it anyways. Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I don't wish that job upon anybody, honestly. Uh, no, you're constantly getting fucking yelled at by everybody, you know, yeah. and then you, then you're basically trying to tell the technicians what they need to do to, to make that customer better. And then, yeah, it just, it yeah. just evolves. So you're getting yelled at by the technicians below you and you're getting yelled at by the people above you and you're getting yelled at by your customers. Mm. And it's like, all you're doing is getting yelled at. Like I can get yelled at a lot. I can take it, but you reach a point where it's like, you know what? I, I, you don't want to fucking do this. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Totally not worth the money. Hell no. Like, and you're getting paid less money. It's like, and, and you're on your phone more and you're like, yeah, you're, you're technically not on call, but you are on call. You don't have to go out and physically work, yeah. but every single day you're on call and you're answering phone calls at like one, two, three in the morning, whether it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So I, while I was there, I started, I, I was in charge of supermarket startup. So this the company I went to was mainly like, like C store based, but they did have a couple supermarket customers mm -hmm. and they were doing a lot of construction at the time. So this was probably six years ago. 
Uh, they were doing a lot of construction at the time with CO2 transportable, transportable CO2 systems. So that's where I first started was about a good six years ago. So I saw the beginning of the iPro and then the transfer into the 326A. And then now obviously they're phasing out the 326A. I think it's, what is it? A 517 or something like that that they're going to now yeah. or something. So I was going to say, I thought it was like a 782 iPad controller or some shit. Something it's, like that. So but it's... Have you met with it, Kevin? No, they 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 put the 326 back into re, into production. Oh, did they? So they yeah. were able to get the parts Cause, out. Because yeah, I was talking to Squires about this the other day. They because yeah. he said he goes, yeah, we can get 326s again. They're making them again. So from what I heard, like some of the parts that they were using were like end of life as far as the manufacturing process for the 326. The electronics so, and shit. They just had to figure out another way to do it. Yeah, yeah they found another way to do it. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, it definitely has its limitations. If they could fix the Modbus part of it to the E2 mm -hmm. and microthermal, like you have to be able to see that thing. Even if they can make it communicate on BACnet, then there's a really good guy over at EMC that can write description files for it. And the cool thing about working with him, his name is Miles, but the cool thing about working with him is that, yeah, you pay him to write that description file or what have you, but if there's any issues with it, he will, it. Work, he will work through those issues with you like I mean, it doesn't matter if it's now or a year from now he'll work it should be writable that's the thing like it's it's a modbus device still yeah so i mean it still should be able to be picked up on the e2 as a modbus device i agree i mean the 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 i bet the problem is that dan foss probably won't give out the inputs list for the 326a and that's why they can't write a description file for it correct that that, that is the issue i'm, I'm assuming dan yeah. foss will give it out I mean, and it's a huge issue because we actually just had an issue with this at, at another rack that I was talking through the phone with somebody. They were there like seven, eight times working on this. My old shop was, and I'm talking to a guy, talking to a guy, one of my guys that I train in the morning. He's like, this thing is, it's running fine. I get here, it's running fine. It's the whole rack was down, crashed down, high head, high head, and finally caught this thing. The why one of the wires had broken in the head of one of the Danfoss transducers. Interesting. So when it, it, the a compressor hit a certain frequency, it would vibrate a little bit. Vibrate, yeah. Lose it would lose the, the transducer signal. It would shut down the high pressure valve and it would fucking smack the rack on high head. Yes. And it would keep doing it. And then all of a sudden it would it would start working again. But like everything you looked at, like if you look at all the data, it's like fuck man, this thing looks like it's shut in high pressure valve. But why? And there's no way to tell why because you can't see any data. It would the... really be nice to graph that. For sure. Yeah. It would definitely really be nice to graph that. Or, or even or even to the point where you could do, if they, they could hook up a, a, some sort of analog output that you could basically monitor the pressure off that, almost like they do with a VFD, yeah. where you could actually shit, that, shit a physical percentage out of what the valve is doing or what the valve is supposed to be doing. I mean, that's one of the cool things about the ICMTS. It, it has the capabilities of zero to five out to your directly to your controller so you can see what percentage it's at yeah for sure yeah um, i guess go ahead so basically yeah i got started and i i've seen the evolution of the first ipro and now the second ipro and 326 and all that and then i decided to i saw the writing on the wall at that company that company ended up going out of business mm -hmm. uh, i left that company six months before they shut their doors uh, and came back to CoolSys, and I've been in, I've been in startup at CoolSys ever since. And I, I, I am right now. My my day to day job is programming for our company nationwide. So I mostly work remotely, but I would say like fifty percent of the week I work remotely, and fifty percent of the week I work out in the field. Like today, I was out of the, out of the customer. We're, we're going to be starting up another TCO2 store. It's got a Kaiser rack. But the thing that really bothers me is they have three different case manufacturers in this store. And they're all using different case controllers. So we've got Core Links, which are... Us, everybody everybody loves those. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Excels and S3Cs. So all in one store. I, I, I need to drink. I, I do, don't like the, the multi-case thing. Like, here's my big bitch. 
there's no accountability with it because you have three different manufacturers and you have a fourth manufacturer for the rack. Mm-hmm. So you have all these people, you have the case manufacturers playing the rack manufacturer, you have the rack manufacturer playing the case manufacturers mm-hmm. and this big old thing and the contractors in the middle just getting fucked. I remember the first, the first TCO2 store I did for a customer. It, this was the customer's first transcritical system at all. The, the customer had a subcontractor in charge of programming Mm -hmm. and it was Hussman, well, LMP rack. And they took a Hill Phoenix program and dumped it in there and thought it was going to be okay. And and like they associated all the inputs and outputs and stuff, but it was just completely bass backwards. And like, I I told them, I was like, I'm not going to start a rack up. Like, this is stupid. I, I go, none of it is going to work. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And we ended up having this big old conference call with all the big engineers from, from the customer and stuff like that. And they're like, why won't you start the rack? And I'm like, because it's not right. The program is not the right program. I go, if you want, my company will pay me to rewrite the entire program. I don't care. I can do that. But I'm not starting this rack up the way it is. And so I ended up having to work with their subcontractor which now we actually have a really good relationship. And, and what it came down to was the subcontractor had never programmed a TCO2 system before. And, and now me and him work very tightly together. That's um, good. So it, it worked, it ended up working out in the end. So there's still wow. that program and stuff. I seen it the other day. <laughs> horrible, dude. Horrible. <laughs> Granted, like, look, it, this is the same program from four stores ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't changed. Hasn't changed. Awesome. It's, it, it's a good program for their racks. The problem is, have you messed with any of the control strategies that the E3 is coming out with or that Emerson's coming out with for the E3 inside supervisor? So um, I, like I, TCO2 based. So I have not, I've got to, I've got to view a lot of them from one of me and Brett's buddies that is doing a lot of it. Yeah. Like he's the one designing a lot of it. Okay. I've got, got to like see a lot of it and it, it's it's nice is it gonna be geared around like the level sensors that like hill phoenix uses or is it gonna be geared like like you know how hill phoenix uses the flex combiners for controlling the oil solenoids and stuff yeah well they created a whole bunch of i yeah. guess pre-can pre-can programs for that stuff now which takes a lot of the flexies out of there and that was the whole purpose like you know right. as you know right since you if anyone doesn't know james james actually writes writes a shit ton of flexible combiners mm-hmm. which you're a special kind of animal to do that to, to be able to write those <laughs> and man so to take out some of that problem wow. you know when, when you have a technician that really doesn't know wow. you know how to deal with that Right. You you have that option of now having a pre can program that has all the inputs and outputs, the delays are set in, and everything for that. Right. Yeah, so the, I, the, I can't wait to see it. Honestly, they they have a predetermined like oil like they have a whole oil system set up, so it could be self contained. But I think a lot of that's going to be going away. Like you think, oh yeah, those what are they? They're not tracks oils. OMCs. The OMCs. Well, they're, yeah. they're high pressure OMCs, but like a lot of it. So we've been switching over to that, but then a lot of the whole oil system is going to be going away. Westermeyer has, we've already done a couple test stores. Mm-hmm. They have a centrifugal oil separator. No more, no more filtered oil separator, no more oil drain solenoids, no more reservoir. Right on. I mean, in so far, this thing has been amazing. They, they also, and, and we can talk about this because I, I'm pretty sure it's, it's going to be out very shortly. Westmeyer is working with one or two manufacturers to, they have this sight glass slash desiccant filter that that's going to be right on the outlet of the oil separator. Okay. Well, if, if not that these CO2 systems have floats or whatever, but at least you know what's going out. Cause normally where's the, where's the, where's the, the sight glass? Sight glass usually after, after the filter, after the filter. Well, this way you can actually see what the hell is coming out of the separator. That's cool. And then it, it's very, very, the sight glass is actually built into the fucking thing. So like, it, it's, it's a really, really, really cool setup. It'd be nice to have a sight glass before and after, like, you know how some of the manufacturers, they'll do like the pulse solenoid after the, the separator. It'd be nice to have a, a sight glass before and after that solenoid. Cause those can get plugged up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So damn small on them. They just get freaking plugged up. Or the, or the fucking orifice, inline orifice that, or I'm sorry, inline cartridge filter thing. Yeah. That, 
plugs up like every it's other day. screen is all yeah. that, that cartridge filter thing is those little stainless ones or whatever that, isn't that I thought, so i thought we were told it was desk kit that's desk kit in there that little that little ready i don't I think, think they are i i think they're just screens the steel screen it's like a slug yeah. Oh, yeah. I, we were talking, Rusty was talking about that in one of his classes and, and he said, yeah, you, you might be able to get this off Amazon or something like that. And so it just in case you can't get it overnight, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, if it's, if it's shipped to where my house is, it'll take a week. Doesn't matter if it's Amazon or not. I live in a rural area. So you live in the fucking desert, but uh, yeah, I love it. But hey, tonight we're talking about, if you can't already tell, we're going to talk about CO2 and CO2 startup with Mr. Coleman here. So you want to start off with maybe like what what some of the things that you do for for prep and, and we can get into the whole thing. We'll just have a discussion about. Well, so most of my startup experience lately, at least the past year or two, mm-hmm. is I've been flying around a lot, traveling a lot. I've been to Montana, Arizona, but most of my experience is when I get on site, you need to have the vacuums almost completed or completed. So I don't really have to deal with vacuums too much anymore. Yeah. But I, I do still do vacuum down here in Southern California. Um, yeah, I'm so jealous. It, it's kind of nice, honestly. I don't know. I'm so freaking busy with with programming and tech support. I, I don't even consider myself a startup tech. I think I actually, on my email, I, I call myself technical services now. <laughs> just just because it's like I'm, I'm working so much well i don't know i'm probably not working as much as brett but i think brett does that to himself yeah no i do well the other thing is too that you didn't mention that, that james also is a, is one of the trainers at course as well yeah, so yeah so i i try and help brett out with that as much as possible that way he doesn't have to make too many california trips why do you think it's going to be 6 a and b in houston you're going to be in california all by your lonesome if everything goes well we'll, we'll be doing a lot of co2 training too so we'll okay. see I mean, the training center is looking pretty good in Houston. I'm not going to lie. You're doing a good job over there. Thanks, sir. So really, my main thing is if I get there and vacuums aren't completed, I'll assist with finding leaks. But especially, like one of the last stores I did was in Phoenix, Arizona. And I get there and they're not pulling vacuums. And they're like, oh, yeah, the rack's pressurized to 100 PSI. So I, I get up on the roof. I hook my gauges up because I, I just have a decent CO2 manifold with hydraulic hoses and stuff like that. I had I just went to hose man like US hose and and had them make hydraulic hoses for me with quarter inch connections. It, mm-hmm. it it's very beneficial when when you gotta like transfer gas from the high side or or what have you when you're pumping out the separator or whatever. So I'll, I'll hook up my gauges or what have you, and the rack's flat, like completely flat. <laughs> So I go downstairs, I hook up, I hook up nitrogen, six pack of nitrogen to it. And I start pumping it up. I'm like, what the heck? What the hell is going on here? It's just fucking blowing. Like, and I'm not building any pressure. And so I leave, I leave my regulator at like just hundred PSI. And I, I walk up on the roof and the, the rack's like, I don't know, probably 50 yards from, from it's basically on the other side of the roof, like compared to the hatch. Yeah. And I can hear the leak. When, when I popped my head out, out the top of the roof it, and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? So I freaking pull the nitrogen off. I weld up the T and then tr- pressurize it again. Mm-hmm. And, and so as far as pulling vacuums and stuff like that, biggest vacuum pump I can get, I, I typically only use one vacuum pump just for the fact of, and, and honestly, maybe Kevin can explain this better than me. But as far as vacuum pumps goes, I only like to use one just for the fact that let's say if you use a bigger one or what have you, you can actually pull through that vacuum pump. Is that theory or would that be? Well, so if you use a bigger vacuum pump, so like, for example, it's not as bad if you have a vacuum pump with a check valve, I've been told. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have like a lot of new vacuum pumps don't have check valves. So like like these ones, if you're pulling through there, like they don't have a check valve in there, so it, it'll if you get one that's stronger than the other, it'll pull through the other one, and you right. have pressure drop on vacuum pumps, so they, on vacuum hoses and equipment, right? Because they're out gassing. Yeah, so if you have one pump with less of a pressure drop than the other, and you're in a super deep vacuum, it could possibly pull air and moisture back through the other one. So I, yeah. I will generally start a vacuum if we if we're under the fucking gun. I'll start a vacuum with multiple pumps. Oh, okay. 
I guess it wouldn't be an issue if like you, you made sure that you ice, like if you were just isolating this vacuum pump to this system, right? And then you're right. isolating that to that, that system. Yeah. You might have a little bleed through. Hopefully you're not having any bleed through, through the, through the ball valves, but at least you could do that. I literally, I, I've come to the point where I don't trust any ball valves. If no, I'm, me either at all. I, I literally, I don't, I don't trust any ball valves. So if we're under the gun though, I, I'll run ma- multiple pumps and I'll get the, the rack below like a thousand down to like sub thousand microns right you can, like a thousand, you cut over to just one cut over to just one pump and let it pull like right. that way i i off gas the rack get all the get all the non condensables out of there get get as much moisture out of there as we can that right. way you let the big pump just do its thing actually i i learned a lot from listening to the hvac school podcast as far as outgassing and and as far as like moisture and and how you can actually change point at which moisture boils off and i did a lot of studying on vacuums from that like the whole theory of if you put water in a room and then move the walls of that room in what are you doing as far as changing the point at which a sealed room let's say this is obviously all in theory well you'd be increasing the pressure correct you're increasing the pressure of that so you're there therefore changing the point at which that moisture will boil up 100%. 100%. That's why we can, that's why we can pull a vacuum on, on a mason jar and have water boil at 75 degree temperature because right. we're basically lowering the boiling point. Yeah. And then I, I learned a lot of, like, there's so many theories that, that all the old timers have. I love, I love hearing all the theories. Oh like, my God, the water freezing theory. Exactly. That you're, you knew exactly where I was going. With that. In the building that's 95 degrees and like, yeah, like I could see that being possible if your freezer was already down to temp. And, and your lines are at like minus 10 or, or what have you, but you a whole bottle of water down the lines. Like. Yeah, exactly. And, but other than that, like all these other, like, I swear to God, it's like crazy rabbit holes that, that people come up with on pulling back. Yeah. I like to use like one of my really good tricks is the true tech tools vacuum gauge where you can actually graph your vacuum. So yeah. it, you can actually, have you seen them, Kevin? The blue vex. Yeah. It's all. Yeah. Weird. Today's episode is sponsored by the RefRush Shield RDP Series Differential Pressure Monitors from Westermeyer Industries, now available for transcritical CO2 systems in addition to other common pressures and refrigerants. When the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Wait too long to replace and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout. But replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The RDP series differential pressure monitors, including the new transcritical CO2 model, are available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyerin.com. That's W-E-S-T-E-R-M-E-Y-E-R-I-N-T-Com. Like it's, Fred it's was getting me like a weird look. Like what the heck is he talking about? No, I just didn't know what, what manufacturer. I did like, I, I don't use tools anymore. Actually, it's funny <laughs> to say that because we were, when I was figuring out what to call this episode, I'm like, is it going to be talking startup with James Coleman or is it going to be Kevin and James bashing my woman hands for the next hour and a half or whatever? Yeah, clean hands, um, pretzel. The, see, the, the problem with the blue vac, my only problem with it is the oil issues. Like it gets contaminated with oil super easy. I agree. So, so like doing like, I do like a lot of remodel stuff. Like out of remodels, it fucking sucks because like you're constantly cleaning it and yeah. like a little bit of oil gets on it. But like, the other thing that sucks about it is it's so fucking good. Like it's you hard to get a tenth of a micron. Yeah, it's 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 a lot it's a lot harder to get a vacuum than all these boomers talk about, like with the, oh the old the, the the black one where you adjust the dial on it and uh-huh. the thermal whatever. Oh, I can hold a hundred microns all night long as you offset it by three hundred and fifty yeah. microns. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. man. I'm just I'm, I'm using the temperature compensator on there. That's what that's for. Yeah, the I old mean, really, really like one of my main things that I'm looking for is when I valve off and I let that vacuum hold. Am I I'm consistently rising and, and and am I rising at a rate higher than one to two tenths a second? If I'm if I'm rising at a rate higher than one to two tenths a second, I'll I'll definitely sit there and watch it and see if I start to level out. I, I like to see my my rate of rise at, at about one to two tenths a second. And I can be very confident that I have no moisture in the system and I have no leaks in the system. 
So, but if I'm consistently rising and obviously 20, 30, 40 microns a second, I know there's, there's, there's a problem. There's, there's a leak. So, and really like one of the main reasons that I can be so efficient is like, I've seen this work and, and I know it works. And because of that experience of, of watching these vacuums so many times and doing so many startups in the past six years that I can tell pretty much right away when I have a leak and, and when I don't just, just by watching that, that rate of rise and, and following my graph. How um, many, how many wet cases have you gotten lately? Have I had lately? Yeah. Well, I'm going to have the, the Carnot system. So we, we had like, it was a store come in and the fitters were cutting the lines and like, fuck, there's water coming out of the, oh my God. They would test them, make sure there's pressure in them. And they were just whacking them with the Milwaukee finger snatcher. Right. The, the electric tubing cutter. <laughs> that, well, that, that like curled over one or whatever. No, like the, the, the power cutter, the M12 power cutter. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Depends. I call it the finger snatcher because like, I know like six people have gotten their finger caught in that thing now. Shit. Oh my God. Why it's like they, one thing I do really close. It sounds stupid, but like, it sounded like they were retarded. We all made fun of them at first until it kept happening. Well, what happens is guys use it in tight spots, like under a case. It's great. Uh -huh. Well, you don't realize like your fingers like super close. And if it's smaller pipe, and like your hands, you gotta like kind of like have it at a certain spot. You have to use the back of your hand to like kind of push it against oh. it, it's your fucking glove. Like I refuse to use a glove with it. It'll pull your fucking glove in and grab your finger. Just think of it as Brett's hands. It just they would fucking annihilate completely. Fucking those clean hands. He's got them dishwashing hands. Yeah, he's probably he probably doesn't even have calluses anymore. You guys, can keep, you guys can keep going with the podcast. I have dinner I have to make for the kids, so <laughs> just letting right. you know. But no, we. We, they, we're cutting in these cases and they're fucking shooting water everywhere. Holy shit. So it's like, it's, it's like, so I ran into that a couple of years ago on a system and I basically made them cut and I was helping as well because it was just, we were under the gun. And once, we, once I figured out that there was so much water in the system, we flowed nitrogen and, and that RX 11 flush through everything. I think we went through like six cases of RX 11 flush to try to get everything out. And we were successful, but it was a nightmare. It just takes, like, we did a bunch of frozen food doors, and I just ended up wiring up the heaters and cooking the cases. <laughs> well, putting them on, like, freaking 100% yeah. of the time until the gaskets were melting. So we were keeping the cases at, like, 96 degrees. Holy shit. I mean, it, like it, it, rain. yeah, I mean, that was the only thing we could do, is, like, Damn. it'd speed up time. Is, How is, long did it take? A day and a half. Wow. How hot were the cases? They were at 96 degrees. Yeah. What'd you do? Wire, wire a temp sensor and put them on a contactor or something? We were cycling the heaters on a, on a so I had defrost heaters in the cases yeah. and the manufacturer did not, thankfully they did not have a high safety. Oh was, really? They didn't have a, a high limit clicks on? So we're in there and I was cycling the defrost contactor on and off on temp. Crazy. And That's a good idea though. We, we, I got enough heat in there to cook, cook the water out because I mean, wow. need heat, like heat is the only thing that heat and vacuum is the only thing that, that removes that right. nice shit. Right. Like it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't absorb anything. So right. another yeah. one of my tricks of the trade is like those eighth inch MPT plugs. Yep. I keep a shit ton of those. I mean, like I've just acquired them over doing so many startups. I keep a shit ton of those in my van and in my bag. And so I'll pull out. A lot of the case manufacturers, they'll come with the transducers and stuff inside the cases already installed. And I'll pull out every single transducer and I'll put plugs with Teflon or whatever in every single case. Because as far as my past experiences go, I've had so many issues where one or two angle valves or three angle valves will bleed by. And you're, you're sitting there chasing this tiny ass little leak and you're not able to pull vacuum because of it. So that's like one of the first things I do is I go in. And I put in eighth inch MVT plugs in every single well, transducer. It's the opposite. So I open them all up. Do you? Oh, so you open them up to the transducer or? Well, up to the transducer and I pull vacuums on the transducer. Do you? You don't even care anymore. Huh? Well, it's I mean. Just the wise tail that it destroys it. Technically, they're not absolute pressure sensors. So I, I would, I could see it hurting. So the, the only, so the, what I was told, the only transducers that were affected by that were the original CPC transducers, the 12 volt ones, the old ones. 
Oh, okay. Genesis ones. Now, microthermal actually encourages you to do it. Really? So the, all, all their transistors are vacuum rated. You could pull vacuums on their transistors all day long. So hmm. that, that would mean they are absolute pressure. Yeah. They, they are absolute pressure sensors. So like on a car engine, they'll, they'll use the back in the day, they used to use map sensors, mass airflow sensors. Now they're using map sensors, manifold, absolute pressure sensors, yep. which are rated for vacuums and stuff. Yep. So, so like you, you could technically pull on them all day long. So I, I yeah. always, so I do this for two reasons. I do it a for the vacuums because that way the, the valves back seated and I can, I could nylog the, the, the cap. Yeah. So it's, it's nice and good. I can nylog the cap, make sure they're not leaking. And I want them pressure tested for the, the original pressure testing because I want to know if any of them are leaking. Right. So I really I, like that, that vacuum seal or vac seal stuff, whatever it is, but it's I nasty. don't know if they still manufit. It is nasty, but I don't know if they still manufacture it anymore because of some issues with, I don't know, EPA or something like that. Yeah. I'm a big fan of leaving them all on because that way, and if I put my hands on every single one of them, I know they're open and yeah. I don't have to deal with it during startup. Make, yeah. going, going back in and installing them all or making sure they're all hooked up and they're ready to go. I really just have them all good to go. One of my actual favorite tricks is I, I learned from listening to you guys. I don't remember. I think it was your, your CO2 startup episode, but duster. So like basically while I'm pulling my vacuums, that's when I switch my focus to all the case controllers and I will check every single case controller and I will go through every single temperature sensor, coil temp, suction line temp, discharge air temp, and I'll, I'll use duster. Probably go through, depends on how big the store is, two, three cases of duster, maybe even four or five cases of duster. I, I really don't care and check every single temp sensor and every single transducer. So what I'll do is I'll typically, if, if we are contracted to do the low voltage, I'll pull a cat five to the sales floor. I'll, sometimes it, depending upon how big the sales floor is, I'll pull a cat five to each end of the sales floor and I'll hook up a wireless router and have my computer with me right basically right next to me. So I can check every single sensor and, and watch it change temperature. And then I'll unplug each transducer. Or, or plug in each transducer to see if I get a value change. And, and that, that definitely, it's like back in the day before CO2 systems, everybody has gotten so comfortable with just basically flipping a switch and then figuring out all your issues. Well, now with these CO2 systems, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more likely to find all my issues first and then start flipping switches. And, and just half of that is just figuring out ways to find those issues. And, yeah. And so you can move forward. I mean, uh, the validation of the case controllers is the biggest thing. That's why I like the SC three is a little more. Yeah. I can at least do it on my phone. Right. With, have that access. I can at least make sure that everything in the app reads right. Right. Yeah. But the biggest thing I like about the S three C's is not being able to tune the PID because I don't feel their PID is right yet with CO two systems. It they it does not hold set point worth a crap, nope. in my opinion. It's well. I guess it depends on what customer you're at. Yeah. I, I feel that like one customer's control, the way that they're doing it is a little bit better than the next customers. Right. Remember, like a lot of that stuff's being set by the OEM. Yeah. So the OEM requirements at customer A are different at customer B. Right. That's so you go, you go into a Walmart and they're a lot tighter. It's just, I, I like the dick cells just for the fact that you can, like me, I can sit there and tune, what is it, P and I, right? Yeah. My uh, only complaint with those is they're so canned that, like, you can't do a lot. Wait, with dick cells? Yes. Yeah, I would agree. But they're, they have, they have a perfect application. I mean, they're, 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 they're an application where, like, I mean, you don't need to adjust a lot, but, like, they're, right. There's not a lot of flexibility when you comes to other things, but that's why the CC200, which I'm getting ready to do a, a store with them. So I haven't worked with them yet. I've been talking to Sean Gay about them, so we'll see what happens. I want to I want to do some jobs with the CC200. So I mean, yeah, that that looks very promising. But yeah, like the 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 duster trick is fucking killer. It's amazing. <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, holy shit, I'm doing this on every job. I think right now I actually have two cases of duster in my van. So just, just because it's like one of my number one used to, I, I use them on leak detectors 
holy uh, shit, this guy is uh, getting high. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Sir, can you, can you explain why you have all this dust dirt? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a hobby. <laughs> do, you, do you take the cans of dust on, onto the airplane and they're wondering why you're in the bathroom so long? Right. Yeah. It's all, th- this, mean, it's all right, Brian. At least I'm not keystring relays. <laughs> So we, we actually did this the other day because we ran out of duster and uh, we were kind of at a pinch. We were wheeling around a fucking CO2 tank. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> a full size, what, 50 pounds yeah. of liquid? We, we were literally walking around the CO2 tank with a, we have a braided steel hose that we use yeah. and we shut off on the end of it. And Jake's just walking around the fucking, the, this, just giving her a squirt every once in a while from case to case. I mean, it, it, it worked. I mean, we were in a, the same store as you're starting up, and it's just yeah. like we're just walking around the same aisle. It's, it's closed off, just just hitting every case. Dude, if my project manager saw me doing that, they would have a shit fit just for the fact that CO2 is so hard to get out here right now. Oh, dude, it's so easy for us. That's the only thing that sucks. Like, like because we air gas is like where they manufacture it is yeah. like 20 minutes from our shop. So air gas and Lindy. Uh, are, are technically the two man- manufacturers, right? I think Praxair gets it from Lindy. But, like, so the job that I'm doing, well, that I'm going to be doing starting up, starting Monday, it, it we need, like, 14,000 pounds of liquid. I probably need 18,000 by the time it's done. Probably. It's, it's a car now wreck, so I'm, I'm assuming we might have some relief issues. But, so we need 14,000 pounds of liquid, and we had to cut a deal with Lindy in order to be able to get the refrigerant. So, because they, there's just they, not that much in the area. Are they bringing a tanker truck out? No, it's all, all 50 pound cylinders. So we're getting ready to do a job and they're bringing a tanker truck. That's cool. What's the pressure of that tanker truck? They said they could pump it up to fuck it, whatever we want. Really? So That'll it's be- it's got, be an, to see. it's got an external pump on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's cool that the tanker has the external pump on it. So the so, external pump, he said he could pump it up to 1,800 pounds if we yeah. want. The problem is you're going to hate it. They only do like four. Well, I don't know. It depends how big your store is. It only does like three to 400 pounds of liquid per hour. So it, it might take it's you some like time. Four times that. Really? So we were looking at... because. The only way we could find the quantity that we needed was, well, previously, before before we got in contact directly with Lindy, was BGL tanks. And those BGL yeah. tanks, they relief at 350 PSI. And so they're asking me, they're like, oh, is this going to is this gonna work? And I'm like, well, technically, no, unless I freaking pinch down the suction set points on the racks. I go, and so here's here's the problem with that. I go, you might want to talk to the manufacturer and see if they'll void warranty if we do that. And so they talk to the manufacturer and they're like, yeah, we don't want you doing that. You're going to raise the, the compression ratio so damn high, you're going to kill a compressor right away. And so, so they ended up being able to find it, but they were going to provide us with a, a pump. Well, the problem was the pump's pneumatic. And yeah, so it was a pneumatic pump and you have to use an air compressor to run it. Well, just the air compressor alone was going to cost like five grand. And then renting the pump was another like two or three grand just to rent the pump. Damn. And, and it was like all this other stuff. And I'm like, honestly, like at this point, unless you guys find me high pressure tanks, then we're going to have to do this. And the manufacturer is just going to have to suck it up and I'm going to have to suck down the compressors. But luckily we ended up getting a hold of Lindy and, and cutting the deal and, and making it happen. So they're going to basically at all times solely for our use, they will have 10,000 pounds of liquid. You should get them to get, send you out bottle racks. I, we just did this with air gas. It was fucking amazing. They sent me out bottle racks. So the entire skid was tied together. So is it like like a, like a six-pack of nitrogen style yes. bottle racks? Yes. That would be rad. That oh, would, I had a, they have a header oh, system built into it or something? Yes. It, had a, it, it was complete header system built into it. So all you had to do was go through and uh, turn the tanks on. That's cool. So... Carnell, I'm sure you've probably used it, but Carnell has a manifold, a charging manifold. <laughs> yeah, just to make sure that makes it back. Like every we've every one of we've done is is one of my startup guys has it in their van. Oh, seriously? They oh take, yeah. Yeah, I, but I don't. I, I took mine like 
years ago, like, like my nice stainless charging manifold. Yeah. You take out the core. I took all the quarter fittings out of it. I went quarter to three eighths flares, yeah. and I run. I took their their nice service valve or the CO two tank valves. They they supply you with quarter inch taps. I bush them up to three eighths flare, and then I run three eighths black hoses on there, and it rips CO two through there through a half inch. Hose. You could probably hear it whistling. So I, I mine has seven taps on it. I can empty seven tanks into a into a CO two rack if I put a half inch hose tap on there in about eight minutes. Holy crap, that's impressive. That's pretty cool. I'm definitely maybe I'll reach out to our, our my project manager and see if I can get Lenny to put them on the racks, just like the six packs of nitrogen. That he cool. so much I, what I was thinking, I was like, dang. So then if I have six packs of nitrogen, or like six packs of CO two tanks. Plus that six tank charging manifold, I could hook up essentially six six packs to each rack. So what's what's six times six? That's thirty six. And each each rack we're, we're calculating each rack takes about thirty three hundred pounds. So it's like sixty tanks per rack. So, so I've been kind of like messing around with something, and I've almost got it figured out how I want to do it. But like I have this problem. Like uh, obviously, CO two startups usually take two people. Like it usually had you, you, you two startup guys on site. Yeah. Being kind of tough. Competent. Especially. Competent. Yes. And like when you're getting into these smaller accounts, like Aldi and Trader Joe's and stuff like that, there really isn't margin for that. Right. So what I've been kind of messing around with, usually I only need a second guy on site when charging is happening. Right. Usually using the construction foreman. I mean, they got enough stuff to do if whether they're they're buttoning up trains or everything right. else. So I've been messing around with it. I, I, I have it working for like purging now. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing is taking Amazon sells like remote relays. Mm-hmm. Like you could put on a keychain, like a car keychain, and it's a remote relay. And it'll drive like 7,500 feet. Some of them are 200 feet. And it's driving a solenoid. A coil? Yes, it's driving a coil on a solenoid for purging. So the guys can just hit it on the lift and start to purge, stop the purge. Right. I'm trying to get my hands on a high pressure CO2 solenoid and, and see the coil that. diameter, see if that coil will fit over it. Oh, no, I'll just get a coil for for whatever it is and then yeah. run off the roll relay so I could start charging and be inside doing whatever I need to and just stop charging immediately. That would be rad. Let me know if you figure out. I might even start looking into that. I just need I just need to find one of the DN solenoids, the high pressure solenoids. Right. But I'm, I'm trying to find one where I don't have to pay for it. It's just like came with a rack and right. just somewhere speaking of that i was the store i was at today just overlooking and, and helping the foreman out they put i think it was 110 bar hot gas dump solenoid that it's rated for 110 bar i didn't i couldn't find any other information on the valve but the, the obviously 110 bar it's less than 1740 psi so my relief on my high side is 1740 and so i'm kind of worried about that hot gas dump solenoid on that high side of the system because it's only rated for 110 bar. I don't know what the burst pressure is. I'm assuming that the pressure that they stamp on the side of the valve is is working pressure. So I'm assuming that burst pressure is higher, but I oh, still want probably, to verify that. Probably way higher. Hopefully, like you get to take it out and it's like the right size solenoid and you could just use it for running the, the charging. That'd be cool. It, it's sweat in it's sweat in there. Oh, unfortunately, I wish yeah. it. I wish it was those stainless ones with the flared, uh, that, not flared, the uh, compression fittings. That, that's what I'm looking for to kind of like mess with this because it'd be a lot nicer to be able to just hit the button on my keychain. Stop. Okay. The I'm or wondering what the delay is on that. It's it's not very long. Right. Like it, it's pretty quick. Right. That's like one of my biggest complaints about all the EMS systems this day and age. The the update rates are so slow. So, yeah, it's it's not where it should be for how cheap processes are. Yeah, I, I feel I feel like as far as technology goes, I feel like refrigeration and air conditioning systems are always like five to ten years behind the actual technology industry. There's there's so like I mean, if you look at how integrated you can make your house these days, it, it, it's sad that that the integration as far as are the systems we work on it is still so far behind. Well, and then if you look at like the HVAC sector, like the actual like controls that they're using, 
Mm. I mean, they're leaps and bounds. Like, uh, like ahead. they are yeah. critical, but like they're leaps and bounds ahead of us for just say for graphics mm. and like processor speeds and integration between manufacturers. Pretty much every manufacturer you go to in like the HVAC sector, they all have to talk to each other. Whether there's medicine, train, carrier, yeah. like we all have to be. It, it, there is no if, ands, or buts. It's like you're either integrated with everybody else or you're on the whole crowd. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, you look at Emerson with site supervisor and E3, the capabilities that they're, they're doing with that, just being able to write a description file and, and, and send it out so you can connect to any device is, is, is one of the cool things that I like about the E3 and site supervisor these days. But so they're, they're catching up. They're slowly catching it. So what's your thoughts on the, on the, on the starting up the oil system? Like how, how, how do you go about it? Like, how do you, are you pulling vacuums, breaking it and then starting your, getting your oil in there? Or are you putting oil in? I, I don't like doing this, putting oil and then pulling vacuums. Nope. I'd never do that. I hate doing that. So I'm the type of person that I like to pull a vacuum down to basically as low as I can get it. So 60, 80 microns. Yeah. You know, I, I've heard theory from people saying that oil will start to boil below i've heard 200 microns i've heard 150 microns or what have you so i, I don't like putting oil in until i have a vapor charge on the system so basically i'll i'll start checking all of my case controllers and everything during vacuum i'll power them up get them online communicating during vacuum and uh, verify sensors. Obviously, I probably won't get completely done with that by the time vacuums are done if my system is, is pretty dry or what have you. But and, and then once my vacuums are completed, I'll, I'll usually bring my vapor pressure up to 50 psi. And that's when I'll add oil and I'll put in dryers and stuff like that. And then I'll bring it up to, well, depending upon how much vapor I have, because like I said, it's really hard to get gas out here. I'll, so I've ran it at 65 psi, like right on the on on the trip point, the edge of trip point before that yeah. liquid. I'm gonna um, be honest with you, like we pretty much like they pretty much sold us the pound sand with vapor tanks. They yeah. got here, they're impossible to get. I can get liquid tanks all day long. Right. Vapor tanks, fucking nope, ain't happening. Well, Kevin, so, it's pretty easy for you to flip a tank upside down or what have you. As far I don't, as the tank goes. I, I I mean I don't flip them. Like I just yeah. I just let them rip. He's yeah, been, no he, I, that's, he, he said that on one of the last podcasts. I was like, you fucking serious at this no, point? Like, like, to be honest with you, we've been doing it for like the last 15, 20 stores. Mm-hmm. Zero issues. Really? Zero issues. Going right? from vacuum, putting liquid straight into it or? Right into the flash tank. Because if you think about it, you have all it that pressure. Instantly. It, instantly. So yeah. it, it's hot, it's boiling, and then we have all that pressure behind the tank. So yeah. if, if, even if you were to hit triple point and make dry ice, that tank is still, I have a six pack of, or seven tanks behind there at 14, 1500 PSI screaming. Yeah. They're, they're making pressure quick. Right. Right. So we, I mean, we, we honestly stop using vapor tanks. The, the startup tech from one of the manufacturers, he's like, oh yeah, are you going to heat up the bottles? I'm like, dude, when we charge this rack, it's going to be 120 degrees ambient. We're not going to have to heat up the bottles. I promise you. Oh, dude, you, you, that is one of the things up here that absolutely sucks ass in the I'm, winter. I guess you could say I'm lucky enough to where the ambient or the areas that I work in, the ambient doesn't get that low. Besides, I had to work in Missoula, Montana last year, and I got out of there right before their first storm. storm. It went from being like 65, 70 degree ambient days to minus 20 